Dear General Clark, Mr. Ambassador, distinguished audience, ladies and gentlemen, I'm really pleased to be back again because you must know this place here in Boston is a place of my biggest success in my political career. You know, want to know why? Because here I was invited for the first pitch in the baseball fight Red Sox against Yankees. <laughs> And I made it. <laughs> and that was a political success because George W. Bush failed in the same situation four weeks before. <laughs> so you understand, I have a very positive memory to my first visit here five years ago. And um, I'm really happy to be back again. Let me begin by expressing my thanks to the initiators of this conference, the students of the John F. Kennedy School of Government, I'm really more than impressed by what you have managed to get off the ground here, and I'm very pleased to have the opportunity to take part. My last visit to the United States is really some years ago, three years ago. You can assume as foreign minister I was a regular guest here on this side on the Atlantic. As leader of the opposition, I find it more difficult to travel. It's not a good idea to leave the government alone too often and too long in case they fooling around and get, get up to mischief. I'm also happy to be here at this particular interesting and exciting time as President Obama embarks on his second term of office here in the USA, but possibly even more so in Europe, in his inauguration as president four years ago was accompanied by overly high expectations. Those who know how politics work might have guessed the impossibility of living up to these hopes and aspirations. Since then, a little more realism, my point of view, a little bit more realism has crept in, yet at the time, the expectations, although somewhat different, are once again extremely high. This is, after all, a president who does not have to worry so much about polls and election dates, a president who can perhaps take greater risks and be bolder. A president who has once again committed himself to doing great things. The world, Europe and Germany and I myself wake expectantly to see how Obama and his administration will tackle the second term of office. But for some in Europe, this expectancy goes hand in hand with some doubts and some uncertainties. Pivot to Asia or Pacific pivot, that is the catchphrase from the last years that gives some Europeans worries about the future of the transatlantic partnership. Will the USA turn permanently away from us and toward the Pacific, had the USA lost interest in Europe now that the Cold War is over? Are we Europeans to be left in future alone to our own devices? Let me say right away, I believe that the many Cassandra-like cries and fear scenarios which are doing the round in Europe are from my point of view very exaggerated and in large part driven by media hypes. But yet at the same time, there are not purely, they are not purely an invention of the media. From the European perspective, there have been a number of indications and signals that have fueled doubt and uncertainty. There was, for instance, 
You remember the farewell speech to NATO by outgoing U.S. Defense Secretary Wright Gates. There was a trip made by President Obama to Australia, his speech in the Parliament of Canberra, in which he clearly stated, the United States is in Pacific power and we are here to stay. There is, in Germany and Europe, famous article of Hillary Clinton in Foreign Affairs, reprinted in many European newspapers with the unmistakable title, America's Pacific Century. And there is, fourth point, there is the adoption of new defense guidelines with a westward shift of defense priorities. All these, ladies and gentlemen, and that is important, happened against the background of the deepest crisis that has hit the European Union since it came into being. It is as if at times the crisis has cast a veil over Europe, blurring our image of the world around us. Maybe this helps explain that the lasting effect the transatlantic criticism and the deliberate drift toward the Pacific has had on US European partners. But if I'm not mistaken, we have now come already through the worst of the Euro Atlantic Depression. That is my impression. We have won ourselves some breathing space in the Euro crisis and a freer to look further afield again. On both sides of the Atlantic, sincere efforts are being made to prevent things being driven in the wrong direction. The speech was which um, Vice President Biden gave to the Munich Security Conference a few days ago <coughs> demonstrated, from my point of view, a strong commitment to the transatlantic partnership. This was Certainly good news to concerned Europeans. The speech has helped inject more calmness, objectivity into the debate about our partnership, which I feel had become a little bit overexcited. While the fact that the USA is turning more towards the Pacific cannot fail to be concerned to us Europeans. It is important to state quite clearly, and this is my position. We would have far greater cause for concern if the USA did not take interest in the developments in the Pacific region. What would we say if our most important partner, the only partner with enough weight to influence shift in the global power architecture, what would we say if this partner were to miss or ignore such historic shifts? I don't need to tell anybody in this room today that we are talking about a region which is, in every respect, will be in future one of the world's most important centers of gravity. That is why the Europeans should not look on America's engagement in the Pacific region, let's say, with a fear of being abundant. But rather, we should welcome it outright. And indeed, we should simply ask ourselves, what can we do for our part? One thing is certain. We Europeans must get used to the fact that the world is changing. Or in my words, which I use in speeches in Germany, not the strategies in the USA have changed. The reality has changed. Respective weights are changing and the attention is following this direction. There is no point in lamenting the supposed withdrawal of America's love. There is no point in worrying about it. And there is also no point in invoking the good old days 
and descending into transatlantic nostalgia. Rather, we Europeans should focus on developing our own responses to these geopolitical changes or define our own interests. And we do well to seek stand shoulder to shoulder with our natural partner here in the USA. What does it mean, ladies and gentlemen, in concrete terms? I can summarize in five points. Firstly, there is one subject on everybody's lips, but in order not to stray too far from our topic, I will merely touch on it here. The project for a transatlantic free trade zone is gaining momentum. And I welcome that very much in the face of global competition, not only from Asia, it would be foolish to continue to block each other's growth potential. I'm realistic enough to know reaching an agreement will be a question of years, not of months. But every step towards more free trade is an important step towards enabling us to hold our own against global competition. That was the first point. Second point, we European too need a far more distinct footprint in Asia and the whole Pacific region. We have close economic relations with China and the Southeast Asia region. Germany is China's number one choice of partner in Europe, but in the region as a whole, we do not really register and are not really taken seriously as a political force. Up to now, Asia policy for Germany and Europe has been first and foremost trade policy. But we must also take an active interest in the stability of the region and therefore offer and present ourselves in the region as a security player too, not only vis-a-vis -vis the countries of the region, region themselves, but also vis-a-vis -vis our most important ally, the USA. Until now, ladies and gentlemen, there is actually no serious strategic dialogue between Europe and the US on this question. It would be a good beginning to establish a permanent forum for dialogue and discussion on our common interests, our objectives in that region, Eastern Asia. Third point, the USA rightly claims to be both an Atlantic and a Pacific power. The same applies, ladies and gentlemen, by analogy to Europe. We too cannot look solely towards the Atlantic. For instance, whether we like it or not, we Europeans cannot ignore a neighbor of size and weight as Russia. Russia is difficult, perhaps more than ever in the last decades. But for us in Europe, an indispensable partner in question of European and also international security, and furthermore. Russia, for its part, from his, from his own perspective, sees itself as a European and, you expect it, as a Pacific power. Remember only the last APEC summit in Vladivostok, with nearly the same expressions from Hillary Clinton on the one side and President Putin on the other side. It is searching for its role, Russia is searching for its role in a future multipolar world order. And that is sometimes the ways and means sometimes irritating enough. Geopolitically, it regards itself as a pole and a bridge between the Pacific region, the European Union, and Central Asia, with its wealth of natural resources, 
its military threat potential, and as permanent member of the Security Council, Russia remains, if not a world power, an important global actor, a power which cannot be ignored in the establishment of a new world order. I therefore think it would be an intelligent and right course, a course of action, to continue the process of Russian-American rapprochement begun in President Obama's first term of office. And I'm pleased, although the conditions are not better than four years before. I'm pleased the president has made it clear that this is his intention, also in the second term. There are, from my point of view, plenty of starting points in the area of disarmament, for instance, with regard to a further reduction of strategic nuclear arsenals, but also with regard to the admittedly more complicated questions of sub-strategic uh, sub or tactical nuclear weapons or with regard to missile defense. Europe, and in particular Germany, with its decades of experience in dealing with a difficult neighbor, can perhaps be helpful in many ways in the process of American-Russian rapprochement. Fourth point. Fourthly, and now I come to the central issue of today's discussion, geopolitical changes will inevitably have their impact on transatlantic cooperation within NATO. There are those who, in the face of shifts in the geopolitical power and changing threat situations, are already writing NATO's swan song. I want to make it quite clear, I regard this view in roughly the same way as I do talk of the sunset of the transatlantic partnership. I'm completely with Vice President Biden, who very aptly stated in Munich, the question of whether NATO has accompanied the alliance at least since the 70s. And yet NATO has always continued to find its way. I believe NATO remains the central guarantor for security of Europe and the entire alliance. In my opinion, the argument that the threat situation in Europe makes NATO dispensable is, from my point of view, extremely reckless. Germany may not be directly threatened for the foreseeable future, but it was only a few weeks ago that Patriot missiles were stationed in Turkey on the alliance external border. NATO also retains in fu its function as a forum for transatlantic dialogue. And likewise, it should be said, for dialogue with a lot of non-member states, including Russia. And at last but not least, NATO continues to act as a service provider for the United Nations, providing these services from case to case where this is requested and makes sense. I cannot support talk of demise of NATO. I am equally skeptical about talk of endless, I am also skeptical about the talk of endless expanding the alliance, either in terms of its members or in relation to its sphere of influence and tasks. Even the limited tasks, even the limited tasks, have just described confront us with uh, big challenges. American complaints about an increasing shift of the financial burden from Europe to the other side of the Atlantic cannot simply be brushed aside. Neither can calls for Europeans to take on more responsibility. On the other hand, we must be under no illusion. The leeway for European members of NATO is very limited at a time when the euro is in crisis and the strict austerity policy is still in place. 
it is important to state clearly there is no prospect of a significant increase in European defense budget. And after Munich, I'm afraid for the first time with this will be the same situation on both sides of the Atlantic. There can only be one way out of this dilemma between increased requirements and limited resources. We must take ourselves more efficient and better coordinated. We must commit ourselves more resolutely on the path of specialization, smart defense, pooling and sharing, these are the watchwords. Behind them lie slow and painstaking processes, but there is no reasonable, no practical alternative to them. We have only limited means, and it would be senseless to invest them in duplicated structures and not necessary military capabilities. Ladies and gentlemen, in the end, burden sharing is not only a matter of money. It is also and above all about political responsibility and the willingness to take charge. And on this front, there are definitely signs of movement. In recent years, the EU has on repeated occasions shown responsibility and initiative in tackling piracy, the Horn of Africa, for instance or preventing arms smuggling up the coast of Lebanon. The French intervention in Mali has been an important step in preventing the Sahel region from drifting towards Islamist terrorism. We continue to have a presence in the Balkans with still a few thousand troops stationed there. And we continue to shoulder our part of the responsibility in Afghanistan. Europe, therefore, has shown itself increasingly ready to take on responsibility, including militarily. And obviously, this relates primarily to the immediate European neighborhood, where we as Europeans are particularly able and willing to guarantee joint security and assume shared responsibility in this context. There is undoubtedly still room for improvement, yes, there are capability gaps, yes, that gaps that need to be closed, weaknesses in interoperability on which we have to work and, and so on and so on. But in my view, and that is important, in my view, the cliched view that Europe is completely reluctant to assume responsibility is well out of date and no longer reflects the complex reality. We know about the expectations of our transatlantic partners and we recognize our obligations and responsibility as Europeans. But, and this leads me to my fifth and last point, we should also know our limits. There are conflicts in this world which we have a shared transatlantic interest to be resolved and which would overstretch Europe if we acted alone. I therefore emphatically welcome the very clear commitment made by President Obama and Secretary of State Kerry with respect to the Middle East. This is precisely the sort of signal I would have wished to see at the beginning of this second term of office. I know this conflict quite well from my time as foreign minister and the seven years responsible for the intelligence services. I have visited the region many, many times, know the main actors. The present situation indeed fills me with concern. Time threatens to run away from us. A two-state solution appears to be retreating ever further into distance and there is no sign of any realistic alternative to that. The conflict between Israel and Palestine has been somewhat overshadowed in recent months by the Syrian tragedy and the struggle for hegemony in the Arab world. I believe this distraction is unwarranted and dangerous. 
the perpetuation of the conflict, entire region, the risk that the entire region gets on fire. A solution, on the other hand, could set in motion the process of establishing long-term and enduring peace in the Middle East region. But that will not happen without the USA. Nobody apart from the USA is ultimately able to bring to the table the political, economic, military power, power that is needed to convince the parties to the conflict <laughs> of the advantages of the political solution. And that also holds for true with regards to the conflict on the Iranian nuclear program. President Obama mentioned this conflict with one single sentence in his State of the Union address on Tuesday. He stated very clearly that the US and its allies will do what is necessary to prevent Iran from getting a nuclear weapon. But even more important from my point of view, he stated just as clearly that there is a window of opportunity for a diplomatic solution. A further escalation on the conflict is neither in Iran's nor in the interest of the US and its allies. It is hardly likely that we will witness concrete and substantial steps forward before the elections in Iran in June. But if President Obama was right when he said that now is the time for a diplomatic solution, we should not let time lapse away without taking any diplomatic efforts. Ladies and gentlemen, three days after a truly ambitious and forward looking State of the Union address by President Obama with his clear commitment for a transatlantic partnership and the project of a free trade agreement, I myself, I have no concerns whatsoever about European-American and German-American friendship. We share interests, we share values, we share responsibility, also and precisely in a world that grows ever more complex. Here in the past few days, in the course of many conversations and meetings I have encountered, here in the USA, a firm will to cooperate and even, I would say, a spirit of really new optimism in the transatlantic relations. This should be a spur and a challenge to all us policy makers. I at least look forward to the coming years with, let's say, excitement and confidence. Thank you for your attention.